in our lives, throughout our lives, hopefully, we have goals. We have goals and we have dreams and we will sometimes think about how do I, how do I get to that place? How do I make this happen for me? And God as well has hopes and dreams for each and every one of us. And if you want to have the perfect successful life that you are blessed in so many areas that you feel fulfilled, if you hook your goals and dreams up with God's goals and dreams for you, oh, that's a game changer. You're going to be unstoppable in this life. But to walk in his goals and his dreams, sometimes we have the question of what, what is it, God? You do want to pray for God to show you his goal and dream for your life. Because before you were born, he had a blueprint for your life. He knew exactly where he wanted you to be in life. He knew, he knew the time that he wanted you to be born, where he wanted you to be born, the people that were going to come in and out of your life. And the best way to know his goals is to ask him. Ask him, God, what do you, what do you have for me? What dream do you have for me? What goals do you have for me? If you always feel like you struggle in life and you just don't know your direction, you don't know which way to go or you've tried so hard and it just, where you're at right now is not the place that you thought you would end up, then maybe it's time to ask God, God, show me your will for me. I, I told you my will, but what's your will for me? So those are very specific. But he also, in the Bible, thankfully, there's a general rule, a general goal that he has for all of us. And that's found in the Bible. And the general rule that he has for all of us to be all that we need to be and all that we can become is found in the fruits of the Spirit. In fact, Jesus says that um, he has appointed all of us so that we might go in the world and bear fruit. Now, in our mind, fruit, unless you're a farmer, we go to Walmart and we get fruit, or we go to the farmer's market and we get fruit. And the only rough time that we might have is actually having to get in our car and go get the fruit. And if you get home and there's a couple that doesn't taste too good, well, that's a little disappointing. But it really hasn't cost you a whole lot of work. But see, back then, he was talking to a group of people that were familiar with agriculture. They knew if they were going to eat it, they had to grow it. And so Paul relates the fruits of the Spirit like he chooses those characteristics and he calls them different fruits. Also because God really likes nature, he created it. So, you know, we have a lot of references to nature, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, you know, that sort of stuff. And so they use the terminology that that group was familiar with. But they lived in a desert. And yes, at that time, the desert was a little bit more green than it is now, but it's hard work. If you're going to plant a tree, you've got to pull some weeds. You've got to hoe up some ground. You've got to, if you're in Missouri, you've got to pull up a few rocks or two. And then not only that, you can't just go, well, did that, I'm, phew, I'm done. It's a process. You have to tend to it. You have to make sure that there's water, and sometimes you have to dig ditches so that if you do get rain, that it will flow to the roots of that tree. You make sure that when it, as it's growing that you pick off any diseased limbs, any diseased leaves. And then I was always upset because I was that instant girl. I thought the minute that you planted a seed in the ground, the next day I should see some result, right? I should see some progress. But I didn't know that all the progress was underneath the dirt. It wasn't until it was ready to start producing that I actually got to see something with my eyes. And so we, as Christians, sometimes read, okay, here's fruits of the Spirit, and I'll read those in a little bit. Here's fruits of the Spirit. I'm really going to do that. And we get upset if we haven't mastered it in two weeks' time. Well, it's a process. It's a goal. It's a blueprint for our life. 
And Colossians, it says to live a life worthy of the Lord, to please him in every way and bear fruit in every good work. Paul was talking to Galatians when he was talking to them. And what he was doing is the Galatians at this point, this is early on in the church, and they, they were just off track. They were going after goals, and they were producing fruit, but it wasn't fruit that was going to be edifying and edible to anybody. See, their fruits were works of the flesh. There was divisiveness. They were rude. They were backbiting. They were drinking. They were sleeping around. They were doing anything that would feed their flesh. They were producing a lot of stuff. But it wasn't the right kind of stuff. But they were what I heard the terminology yesterday. They were that part-time Christian, you know. And that part-time Christian in this little thing that was shown to me was you don't want to meet a Christian on their day off. And that's kind of like the Galatians. They lived almost every day in their day off except for when they would meet. And then they would become Christians. And Paul was saying that you need to have fruits in your life but not fleshly fruits. And so he was talking about the spiritual characteristics that they called fruits that you needed to, to pursue. And so that's what he's talking about when he's talking in Galatians. So quickly, we're going to read through Galatians 15 and 22 to 23. And this is what he says, that we should, as Christians, to have the best life that we can have these are the characteristics that we need to have in our life. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit, how you know that there is Christ dwelling within you, is your life will have love. You will love one another. You'll have joy. You'll have peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There's your blueprint. There's the things that you need to try to cultivate in your life to have the best life that God has intended for you to have. But here's the great thing. You don't have to do it alone. You, you have, a, you have a, a, a master farmer, a master gardener that can do the things that you can't do to bring those fruits into your life. He used that example of fruit because that's what they understood. Growing and planting, it's hard and difficult, and it can be exhausting. Why did they do it? Because they knew that there was a benefit, that it would bring things into their life. It would bring health into their bodies. So if we produce a work for God, it's also going to require a transformation inside of us. You need three things for a plant to grow. You need some light, you need some water, and you need some nutrients in that soil. That's the same way with our spiritual life. See, Jesus is the light. He's also the living water that will never run dry. And he's also the thing that will feed and nourish our soul. However, it's so good to know that we don't have to do this alone because we actually can't do this on our own. So there's a list of fruits, but they all kind of tie together. And the one I want to talk about today is joy because all the others kind of rest on this joy. Have you ever had somebody that said, oh, I just love life? There's no joy. You're like, really? You do? Yeah, I just, I really do. I, I, I love it. I love you too. And I love God. Okay, you got love, it sounds like, but there's no joy there. See, joy is going to be that foundation. Why is that the foundation? You would think it would be love, right? Because it says God is love. 
But to get through this life, it says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. You have to have strength if you're going to produce fruit in your life. And I'm going to talk about joy in a little bit of a different way today um, to maybe give you a better insight about what that actually means. So if we say that we have joy and we're a Christian, then we should let our face know. So if you're not used to having joy, one of the best things that you can do is smile, even if it's not a real smile, because eventually it'll turn into a real smile. But here's why you even want to fake that smile, because you still get a benefit. Not only are smiles contagious, but even if you do just a fake smile, it just, just goes up, but it doesn't even reach your eyes, do you know that you lower your stress hormones? Do you know that you lower your blood pressure? And you also increase your immune system. A smile is healthy for you. So if you want, if you haven't had joy in your life, start with a smile. Even if you don't feel like it, start with a smile. You know, I want you to be real here, but I don't want you to cause everybody else to be down. You know, talk to, talk to the person that you talk to or talk to someone else. But would you want to go to a church where this is what you see all the time? So glad you're here. Come join us. You are a representative of God. So smile. Even if you don't feel like it, it's okay. It's still going to give you a benefit, and it's going to get the enemy off your shoulder. To me, there is nothing worse than seeing a grown adult pout. I get that from a kid. But man, if you're older than eight years old, I shouldn't see a pout on your face. <laughs> and I shouldn't see a pout to every, everybody that you look at. That's just not, that's not being a representative of Christ. You have a broken heart, I get it. Then you talk to somebody, you lean on somebody. But if somebody makes eye contact with you, give them... Give them a smile. Maybe that's the only smile that they've received that morning. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. And it doesn't even have to be real. How's that? I'm even telling you to fake it. How good is that? Just pull those lips up a little bit. After they walk away, you can go back to the I'm so sad thing. But show people, show people that you have a source of joy. Even if your heart broken, you still have a source of joy because you made it to church. You made it where his presence is multiplied. Why? Because you're here. You bring the Holy Spirit in with you. That's another reason you want to come to church. Man, just so that you can get fortified, so that you can knock the enemy off your shoulder a little bit, because he doesn't want to come in here where the presence is multiplied. Oh, if he can get you isolated, oh, then that's okay. Because then it's, it's just you and your sad presence at this point. And he's okay with that. But man, don't come to church when you're sad. Because something might happen. See, you're going to get fortified. I'm not going to say you're going to come out of here laughing, but I'm going to see, I'm going to say that the shoulders aren't going to be quite so heavy for just a little bit. That you're going to be able to lean into his presence. And if you cry, you cry. But you're crying surrounded by his presence presence multiplied because of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I, I, I imagine a lot. That's just the way that God has made me. And lots of times I will tell my angels as we get in the car, we're going to church. And I can feel, I can just feel a little bit of excitement. Because see, when you come to church, your angels get to come to church. Your angels, when church is going on, they really don't want to hang out on the couch. Your angels are like, man, it's, I thought we were going to go to church. <laughs> I, thought we were going to, I thought we were going to sing praises to him. I, 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 I thought we were going to learn a little bit more about my Heavenly Father's Word. And, well, here we are watching this show again, and we're still in our pajamas. And why aren't we? You know, so I'm a steward of my life, but I'm also kind of a steward of, the angels that he's put in my life. I want to bring them to church. 
I want them to hear praise and worship music. I want, I want my angels happy around me. I want them to have joy because that's going to rub off on me a little bit. So joy is the one that we're talking about today. And how do you get more joy? It starts with thinking some joyful thoughts. And those joyful thoughts, they will reflect in your face and your attitude, your patience, your kindness with what each other. Producing more in joy in your life will bless you and everyone that you're around and every area. See, so what makes a sad life? What starts to destroy our joy? One of those is comparison. I need to be more like this person. Or I was really happy with what I had till, man, I saw what they had. Now I'm not so happy with this anymore. Now I'll be happy when I get that till the next person gets something even bigger than that. And then you're like, well, that was pretty good too. But now then look over here at this. Now I need this. Or I don't know about you, but I like real moments. I don't like always posed pictures. And some of my favorites have been, I would follow this one family that their Christmas card was just real life. Some kids had snotty noses, some kids were crying, some kids were hanging upside down, the mom's hair wasn't brushed, and they're like, Merry Christmas. And I'm like, I can relate. Because see, nobody on social media puts the boring, well, I shouldn't say that, some people do put the boring stuff. But most people will only post when they're doing like the best stuff and they look the best and, and we have a tendency to think, well, that's their life all the time. Wow. And then look at me. Look where they go. Look what they get to do. Look at who they're married to. Look at how their kids are behaving. Look at all that. Oh, look at their cars. And then look at me. See, Paul said to be satisfied in whatever state you're in. It doesn't mean that you don't have goals and aspirations, but when you start comparing your blessings to other people, eventually those don't even look like blessings any longer. So comparison is one of the first ways that your joy is going to be stolen. The other way that your joy will dwindle out is isolation. I can do this alone. I don't need anybody. Me and God are just fine. We don't need nothing. Well, yeah, you do need God, but God says, fail not to assemble yourselves together. There's a reason that he wants that, so that you lift each other up. And the thing is, is he has made you with a, with a purpose. And when you just tuck away alone, you're not fulfilling that purpose because the only one that's there is you. And I get, I get that you need self-reflection time. I get that. But when it becomes a habit or a way or makes you withdraw more and more and more and more and more, then that's not good. And eventually, eventually, your joy will start to dwindle. The other thing that will take away your joy is condemnation. Oh, and the enemy likes that one. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I failed him. It's too late. I can't ask for anything from him. When I start doing better, then I'll start attending church again. I'm just, I'm just not good enough. See, God said that Jesus came not to condemn the world. He'll convict you. But see, he convicts you with love. And he's like, we can do this. He puts his arm around you. He's like, we, we got this. We can, we can do this. The condemnation makes you isolate. And I'm not good enough. See, the enemy wants to do that because then you won't believe in your prayers. Because a Christian that believes in their prayers is going to change the world. So if he gets you feeling bad about yourself, then he's going to say, your prayers don't even matter. Why even, why even pray? You're so dirty. You shouldn't come to God like this. Who do you think you are asking for something from something from him? See, that's, that's the enemy. The other thing that will steal your joy is rejection, hurt. I can't get over this. 
notice what we said there? I. I can't get over this. You're right. On your own, you can't. But the Bible says, but with God, you can do everything. So you and God, yes, can work through this. But you alone, you're right. And you won't have any joy. So what is our part in producing this fruit? Because we said that God has his part. So what's, what's our part? Our part is staying close to him. Our part is our attitude. See, when we finally get the attitude of God, I'm going to let you transform me into what you need me to be. God, I'm going to let you go as deep into the soil as you need to go. The soil, if you haven't figured it out, is your heart and your mind. I will allow you to lead me, talk to me, show me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender to you and I will say what you say. So you want joy in your life and you want all these other fruits of the Spirit? Check your attitude towards God. Is it an attitude of, I need you, God. Not only do I need you, but I want you in my life because I want every area of my life to be producing fruit because it will benefit me and others. But also, God, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to let you get in there and I'm going to let you dig up that soil, that hard crust that's been over the top. It's time. Because, see, I'm already miserable right now, so I don't think I'm going to be more miserable. At least I'll be miserable with a purpose. So, God, take what's going on in here. Show me what to do with it. And what I can't do, then God, I, I need you. I need, I need that master gardener to come in and do something with this plot of land. When you do that, joy is going to be a product. It's going gonna, it's gonna to multiply the joy in your life. So how do we, how do we build joy? Paul, such a wise man, he's the one that's going to tell us. And we're going to read in just a little bit. He's on his journey for the last journey, and he knows this. And just like any good church planter, any good warrior for Christ, he's worried about those that he's going to leave behind. And he's going to write some letters, and this letter that he writes, he's writing to the people in Philippi because they've grown very, very close. And he's, he's mentored them, and he's led them, and he's helped transform their life. And now he knows, I'm going to be out of the picture in just a few short days. And I don't want them to lose the ground that they've gained. I, I want them to carry on. See, if they don't carry on, then my mission has failed. I can't let this new Christianity. I can't let it die with me. So how are they going to carry on? And here is what he writes to them. He writes in the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verses 4 through 7. And he says something what we think is such an odd thing. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'm going to say it. I say re rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all man. The Lord is at hand. Oh, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So this was eye-opening for me. 
Because in the Bible, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, they only had a select amount of words to cover a whole lot of different situations. Now, in the English language, we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of words. So we can help the reader understand easier what we're trying to say. But in those days, one word had different meanings. Like, for instance, we talked before about when they would use the word wheat. Depending on the context, that's why you had to read the context, you would know what are they meaning by that word. Sometimes weep was a little brush, tear of the eye, and other times weep or wept was heart-wrenching sobs. So I would get confused because when I would read the rejoice when trials are coming your way and rejoice I'm about to die and rejoice. And then we would hear, rejoice for the Lord is born. And I would get really confused because one felt really, really happy and the other not so happy. And I wouldn't have put rejoice with the not so happy one. But in the Greek, here was my game changer. Rejoice. It means to return to your source of joy. That's what Paul's telling them. He's not saying, hey, go have a party because I'm about ready to get out of here. They're going to torture me. I want you to go have fun. Yay, rejoice. No, he's saying return to your source of joy, which is God. Return to your source of joy. He says, and again, I'm telling you, return to your source of joy where your joy and your strength comes from because he knows this big shakeup, they're not going to get through it. If they don't have their strength, which is the joy of the Lord, in the Lord, if it's just in temporary things, they're not going to be happy. So that's what rejoice means in this situation. When it talks about rejoice because of your trials and tribulation, that used to really confuse me. I'm thinking that's a little bipolar. That doesn't make sense to me. But when I read it through that terminology, I'm like, I get it. You have trials and you have temptations. Return to your source of joy. Rejoice. That's how you can have joy in every situation. Because you know where your strength comes from. You're returning to where you found your true joy. See, the world will give you joy that's fleeting. It all depends on circumstances. But when you're rooted like a tree in joy, then you're going to be able to produce all these other fruits. Then you can produce the love and the patience and the kindness and the gentleness because you know where you get your strength from. So that's what Paul is saying. So what else he's also saying in here is he's saying to return to that source of joy over and over again, and then you will focus on the goodness of the joy. If you do that, then you're going to have joy in your heart. See, that's what begins to transform the soul, the soil that's in your soul. That's what's going to transform your life. And the Bible says to forget not the benefits of God. When we're going through such a hard time, and it's easy just to see that stuff that keeps slapping us in the face, and we forget, oh, but God was there. But God saw me through. But God's given me compassion now. See, he says, concentrate on the benefits. I'm not saying to pretend it doesn't exist. Be real. But don't stop there. Return to your source of joy. Repeat what is good. They took... Um, uh, two different groups that were going through a therapeutic course, and one of them, they had them write down uh, once a day something they were thankful for, and the other group, they didn't have them do any of that stuff. And without fail, 100% of the group that wrote down something they were thankful for cut their sessions in half compared to those that just stayed focused on their problems. It will bring joy to your heart. Joy, Paul says, is produced in his presence. In that scripture, he said that the Lord is near. So if you want joy, 
Stay next to the source. Don't be like a tree that's just like, I'm out of here, pull up its roots and go sit down in the sand away from the source of water. You're not going to do very well. You might last and look pretty good for a little while, but you've got to hook into that source of living water. So don't, don't walk away from God. Lean on, on him even more, especially when you're feeling weak. Lean on him. Let him be your source. See, here's the thing. We pray for God to come into our life even stronger, but the thing is, is he can't get any closer because he's within us. Now, you can say, I need to feel your presence more because maybe there's other things that's blocking that, but he's as close to you as he will ever, ever be. He can't get any closer if you are a Christian. He is now dwelling within you. And so another good thing that you can think about that is you stay mindful about that. That's going to produce joy because you're never, ever, ever alone. That's something to be joyful about. You're never not seen. You're never not loved. You're never not cared about. You are never, ever, ever alone. That's that's something to shout about. That's something to bring joy. And then if you realize that, you stay sensitive to his presence, and then you stay open to his direction. God, what are your goals for me? How is it that you want my life to be? See, when you understand all of that, that plants the seed of joy in your life. Then also, Paul tells us to bring our supplications to him. That will produce joy. Why? Because you get it out. Be real with God. Tell him what's going on in your life. Lay it all out. Let him help pick up the pieces. See, if we go around pretending we're not broken, he can never fix us. He's like, no, you say you're fine. But I don't see joy in your life. You say you're fine, but I don't see peace when you lay down at night. You say you're fine, but you're more aggravated at people than loving towards people. You say you're fine, but you have a quick quick temper or emotional pouts or upsets. See, that's not that's not fine. That's broken. So be real with him in your prayer life. Lay it down at his feet. Then you make room for some joy to come in, for some strength to come in, to start making your life better. Tell him everything. It's therapeutic. Don't you love it when you have that friend that you can go, I just need to vent, and you know it's not going to go any further, and you feel so much better afterwards because you just got it off your chest? Well, he's the best sounding board because it's not going to go any further. You can trust him with your life. But then that's when he can start to do something with it. But if you just keep it inside, you're never going to have joy. Make prayer a necessity in your life, not an extra, if I remember to. You have a problem, go to him in prayer. You're upset, take it to him in prayer. Tell him everything. Because see, when then you start to walk in joy, you'll have peace. That will give you more capacity to love other people, to be more gentle and patient with them. And now the fruit that you produce is going to be multiplied. So where does it start? It starts with joy. I don't know, I'm going to give you maybe if you want a jump start to your prayer this morning during the closing time. How great would it be to say to God, all that you want to produce, God, in my life, I will let you. I will surrender so I can now live the life that you created me for. That is a beautiful prayer. The closing song that they're going to sing is, what, is it Redeemed? Redeemer. <laughs> I couldn't remember if it was I am redeemed or redeemer. <laughs> but you know, if you pay attention to the words in that song, 
that's going to give you joy. See, because he lives, you can have a wonderful life because of all that he has done for you and I. So I'm not saying you have to go out of here all happy and all bubbly because we're all a work in progress. But I want you to be rooted in the joy, the source of your life, the source of your hope. So in the Bible, when it says rejoice, sometimes it is, yeah, throw a party. And other times it's a reminder, return to your source of joy so that your life will be joyful. I'm so proud of each and every one of you. I love you guys so much, and I'll be praying for you this week. God bless you.